Good afternoon. Um, thank you to Greg and Heltree and, and well as well to Dr. Krishnan for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about something a little bit different than uh, probably your, your usual multiple myeloma talks and, and thinking about a little bit out of the box, which was something we call integrated medicine and how that might really help you as a patient. Um, is it okay if I walk around? Oh, okay. Let me run up there and then I'm just going to walk around a little bit. We'll try to do some audience participation here, if that's all right. You probably weren't prepared for any quizzes or questions, right? Okay, can you hear me okay? Great. A little bit closer. Okay, can you hear me okay? All right. So no disclosures. I'm not going to be selling any supplements or products. You know, Dr. Lee's cure-all. Um, so uh, the outline is really, you know, talking about integrative medicine, and oftentimes we use the terms integrative complementary alternatives, and we'll talk about what that all means. And then in the second half of the talk, we'll talk about, you know, specifically areas such as pain, stress, sleep, and how we can find other ways to help you other than, say, maybe another prescription. Okay, and we'll talk about the evidence. So when I, when I tell people I do integrative medicine, I think I got a lot of funny looks, like, what is this guy doing? And, uh, and I, I get a lot of things from my patients for consults. So people bring me books and, you know, you're hiding a cure for cancer and, and these kind of things. Um, and so there's, it's a wide variety of things that happen out there in the field. Um, and, and Barry Castellith, who uh, created the Integrative Medicine Program at Memorial Sloan Kettering, she used to say there's a lot of quackery happening in the field. And I would say, yes, unfortunately, there is some quackery out there. So if it uh, smells like a duck and quacks like a duck, be careful, okay? Funny, Frank got us started to get a funny feeling that his doctor was a quack. Um, so what is the difference? Who, who's heard about Integrative Medicine? Most people, some people have, some people haven't. Um, what do you think about integrative medicine versus alternative medicine versus complementary medicine? What, is, what does that mean to you? And you could just shout it out. Anybody? Is it all, all the same to you or? Mm -hmm. Okay, so more directed by a physician and thinking about the whole body, the holistic approach, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Just yell it out. It's okay. Don't be shy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yes. Good question. So, um, so let's let's talk about that. So when I think about alternative, uh, exactly right. So I, I do have patients uh, who say, "Well, um, so I'm a GI medical oncologist and." I said, well, I'm going to go try to do acupuncture and treat my cancer. So, okay, that's, that's alternative. That's out of the box. But there are people, you know, I, I know people who've done this. Uh, I'm going to try that. And then there are some people who say, well, I'm going to, um, you know, I'm going to get chemotherapy, get a stem cell transplant, and I'm going to try acupuncture to cure my cancer. I would say, well, that's like a complementary structure, kind of doing a little bit of everything. Um, but integrative is really kind of what uh, someone mentioned earlier is, Really thinking more carefully and deliberately about these different approaches. So if someone said, um, "I'm, you know, I have myeloma. I'm going to get treatment, chemotherapy, go through a stem cell transplant, and I'm going to use acupuncture as a way to help manage my nausea," I would say that's an integrative approach. And and because there's actually data, there's been randomized controlled trials showing that acupuncture can improve nausea symptoms. Okay, so that that to me is an integrative approach. Is really thinking about acupuncture and what is it useful for based on the science that's out there as part of your treatment plan. Okay. So that's really, you know, thinking about it get it together with conventional medicine, is it personalized as in a space and is it safe for uh, that individual patient? Now there, um, there is the NCCIH, National Center for Complementary Integrative Health, which is part of NIH. It actually started in the 1990s, 91, it was Office of Alternative Medicine. It was, you know, it was a new field, no one knew what to call it. Then later on, they renamed it as the National Center for Complementary Alternative Medicine, NCAM. And then more recently, they changed it to uh, in, in, in accompanying in integrative health, because the, the terminology is really changing, and we want to get away from alternative approaches and really move more toward complementary, really integrative approaches overall. And so they define as healthcare approaches that have been developed outside of modern or Western medicine. So it's a, it's a very broad definition. You know, it can include things from Ayurvedic medicine, Chinese medicine, you know, um, Native American approaches as well. So uh, if you look at the NCCIH categories, there's a variety of different categories that we think about. One being you know, natural products or supplements that you see you know, at your grocery store or vitamin store, mind-body interventions, things like meditation. Uh, then you have body-based, so kind of massage therapy, osteopathic manipulation. And then they kind of have this other, which is your catch-all. But this is where you might see these 
kind of entire medical systems like you know traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic medicine. Also, energy therapies uh, would be included in there as well. Okay. So there is a consortium uh, of academic centers uh, for integrative medicine and health, and it really talks about what is the definition of integrative medicine. One, kind of reaffirms the relationship between the patient and the provider. Two, really should be whole person care, holistic care. And I think um, the third and fourth ones are really what differentiate it. It has to be informed by evidence, right? So there has to be some data to indicate why we're, in, you, know, you know, maybe recommending a therapy. And then utilizing all appropriate therapeutic options. So acupuncture is not good for everybody, right? Uh, just like mind-body medicine might not be the right approach for everyone. So really think about that person uh, and a personalized approach to achieve optimal health and healing. Right? So I think this, I like this definition by the consortium. It includes um, over 50 academic centers, including Harvard, Mayo Clinic, Duke, um, other organizations. So when I think about the whole picture, um, and, and you have your the patient, you have the cancer, and you have the two sides of the coin, the yin yang, uh, and then you have all your traditional uh, therapies, right? Uh, surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, uh, of course, stem cell transplant, immunotherapy, uh, as Dr. Uh, Krishna was talking about. Uh, and then we also want to support the patient through the whole journey, right? So thinking about the uh, key dimensions, your physical, uh, psychological, spiritual, and social dimensions. And what are all the pieces of the puzzle that we need to put together to really have a comprehensive, holistic approach to your cancer care, right? And so what does that look like? So on the physical dimension, uh, you're going to hear about like physical therapy from uh, Dr. Chang, but palliative care, nutrition, exercise, you know, psychiatrists, psychologists, chaplains. And then, of course, we have to support you things like health coaches that we heard about earlier, health tree organizations, support groups, education navigators. These are all important part of your entire treatment plan, right? How do we get you through from diagnosis through survivorship? And really integrated medicine is like another piece of the puzzle, right? It's another part of your toolkit to think about how, how else can I have a more comprehensive, complete uh, treatment plan, okay? Now, what's happening in the United States? If we look at the CDC most recent um, you know, data, uh, you know, people are using natural products, you know, one, what is that, one in six, one in seven or so, deep breathing techniques, mind-body techniques, meditation, massage, special diets, you know, acupuncture. So, and this is just adults in the general population in the past 12 months, okay? Um, now, actually, I did this survey when I was in Cleveland, where I came from uh, before coming here. Uh, we were looking at patients' level of interest in different therapies, and you can see massage is, you know, one of the most, uh, in, you know, uh, has the highest level of interest among patients. So, uh, over 50% of patients are interested in that, but there's also interest in meditation, acupuncture, music therapy, yoga therapy. Um, what's interesting to me, we also asked, well, what if your physician recommended it? And you can see in the red bar, actually the interest goes up quite a bit. And then we also said, well, what was it, what, what would your interest level be if we ran a clinical trial? And the interest level also goes up. So we just wanted to get a sense of how do people think about it uh, in different scenarios. So this is the kind of model I've been using most recently in my own clinic when I see patients for integrative oncology consultation. Uh, and so you have the patient in the center, um, their family, their culture. Uh, then we have all the important therapies that we're providing, right? This is an integrative approach, not an alternative approach. And then we want to surround that with all the supportive and integrative therapies that are really important to get that patient, your family through the whole process. And we also want to help support the clinicians. We want to help support Dr. Krishnan and what she's doing as well. Um, and then there are specific integrative therapies in each domain. Uh, we talk about integrative medicine, acupuncture, massage, music and art therapy in the psychological domain, healing spaces. So we have a garden in the back of the new Orange County Lenar Foundation Cancer Center. Um, also at Duarte has very beautiful gardens. So all these are really important. You know, if you've come visit the Lenar Foundation Cancer Center, you'll see it's very intentional in terms of how it looks and how it feels. It, it doesn't feel like a typical cancer. And I'm sure some of you have probably visited, right? It doesn't, it doesn't feel like, you, you know, if it wasn't a sign out, so you may not even know that it's a cancer center. And that was intentional. We really want the environment to be very different. Okay, we didn't want that sterile kind of non-healing environment. So what are some differences between integrative medicine uh, similarities and differences between integrative medicine and supportive care, but they're both about holistic care, um, focus on your quality of life, symptom management. But integrative medicine also thinks about your overall health and well-being. So really you know, more importance on nutrition and exercise, lifestyle medicine, optimizing kind of the whole person, and then thinking about integrative therapies as appropriate when they have evidence base okay, for symptom management. All right. So, and this is a small group, so if you have questions, you know, feel free to stop me. I know we're going to do some question and answer at the end as well. So, um, so when I see patients, these are probably the most common reasons I see patients in clinic, 
one, uh, patients are interested in an integrative or holistic approach to their cancer care. Um, so we do a lot of focusing on things like lifestyle medicine. Uh, I have patients who are kind of interested, you know, when I imagine when you get got diagnosed, you know, your, your neighbor, your cousin, is everyone telling you, hey, you got to do this, you got to do this. And so they come with a list of questions and things they've been sent. And so I kind of go through that list and say, hey, does this make sense? You know, they might have seen Dr. Oz show and he recommended another supplement. So they're like, do I take this too? And, and so uh, we kind of go through all those lists. Um, and then I have patients who have a lot of chronic symptoms who are already on high dose opioids who uh, may not want, you know, they're already getting sleepy or constipated. You want something that's non-prescription to help them with their symptoms like pain. And then I do see patients who, uh, for a variety of reasons, they may be going to Mexico or seen in an alternative clinic and they wanted some guidance. Um, and uh, I think our traditional approach has been if patients were kind of choosing alternative therapies and we said, well, good luck and we'll see you later. So what I try to do is talk to them, uh, guide them. You know, we, we don't always see eye to eye and that's, that's their choice, um, but at least I follow along with them. So if they go to Tijuana, Mexico and want to do alternative therapies, I don't, I don't close the door. I say, hey, let's keep in touch every three months. Let's see what's happening. Uh, and in my experience over the past 10 years, unfortunately, 99% of these patients come back in worse condition, but we want to catch them early, right? We don't want to catch them when it's too late before an emergency happens. So we say, hey, what's happening? Is it working? If it's not working, hey, let's, let's talk again. And, and maybe it's worth another opinion with Dr. Krishnan or your physician about, is that alternative therapy really the right approach? So we, we try to help keep in touch with people and, and provide a way back uh, if things aren't going well, okay? Monitor them. Um, you'd be surprised how many of these alternative clinics, you know, don't check basic labs. You know, they don't get CT scans. I'll see patients and they'll say, well, when's the last time they checked your, your kidney function, your liver function? No, they haven't checked it. And so it, it's surprising what, what some of these clinics might do. So um, I just want to uh, spend one slide on the real importance of lifestyle medicine. And um, sometimes patients will jump to herbs and supplements before they really focus on what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I really emphasize the American Cancer Society guidelines on survivorship around nutrition and exercise, really keeping yourself healthy. Uh, that's really the, the foundation of an integrative approach. So we, for a lot of patients, I'm focusing on this area. Um, I remember I had one patient uh, one time, I forget what kind of cancer she had, but she was, she was smoking. And she said, Dr. Lee, I need a supplement to negate the effects of smoking. I was like, oh, I'm sorry, that's, that's a tall order. And maybe you should just stop smoking. But she's like, I love it. I know, but you know, you have cancer. And so, um, you know, we have to be realistic. Uh, but I focus on this because it's so important, but I think people often forget that their own health is really a foundation from which you can go from, right? So keeping that in mind. Now, this just came out like a couple months ago. The Society for Integrative Oncology with the American Society for Clinical uh, Oncology uh, put out guidelines for integrative medicine and pain. So, uh, and it's, it's out there available. It's uh, free access for all of you. Where we really looked at the evidence, I was part of this panel over, it took us about a year, year and a half actually, to look at through all the data and look at the uh, re research in terms of how can we help pain in, among cancer patients with integrative therapies. And so these were the six major findings for which there was um, a moderate level of evidence to say this is worthwhile to think about. So acupuncture for patients experiencing what we call aromatase intus arthralgia. So there's some certain medicines of breast cancer that cause a lot of joint aches. And so acupuncture was one shown to be helpful. Those also experiencing general pain or musculoskeletal pain would benefit uh, from acupuncture. Um, surprisingly, uh, reflexology and acupressure can also be offered for patients who are experiencing pain during treatment. So if, um, you know, if your platelet count is too low or you don't like needles, it's, you can still get reflexology or you could get acupressure. Right? It doesn't mean you can't use those therapies. Um, there's data around massage can be offered for patients or breast cancer also generally through uh, symptom management. Um, and then uh, hypnosis has also been shown to be helpful for patients undergoing uh, procedures like biopsy. Okay. We can really do, and I'll talk about some of the data in a little bit here. Okay. How, how are we doing on time? I want to make sure we're okay. Okay. All right. Just want to make sure we're on time. So this is a recent study published in JAMA Oncology. Uh, this is from June Mao's group at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where he had a large randomized trial looking at uh, electrical acupuncture, versus auricular acupuncture versus routine care. And what you can see here, those blue and kind of the dark blue lines did much better than usual care in terms of their musculoskeletal pain. Um, so again, showing the data that there's real uh, evidence that these acupuncture type therapies can be quite helpful uh, and don't, you don't have to rely on, on more medicines necessarily. Um, and actually, you know, it, it has, uh, you know, the effect lasts, you know, beyond just the treatment. So I think they had like 
12 or 16 weeks, and they still had benefit at 24 weeks. Uh, this is another one where they just use ear acupuncture. So I don't know, anyone here uses acupuncture? A couple people. Have you had ear acupuncture as well? Yeah, okay. So if you don't want the needles in your body, you can just put little seeds or little beads in your ear as ear acupuncture. And in this study, what you see on the left-hand side is real ear acupuncture. Uh, and then in the uh, two right columns, let me see here. You can see here, this is actually placebo. So they kind of put it in fake points or they, you know, these are placebo points. So compared to the real acupuncture, you can see the score went down from in the mid 50s to mid 30s versus in the fake acupuncture, it was still in the 50s. Okay, just demonstrating it's not just a placebo effect. There's a real effect to some of these therapies. Um, this is a large randomized trial run by Gene Kutner out of uh, Colorado, where he looked at massage techniques for patients with cancer. And what you see is that both, the, uh, not only did their pain, this is um, the massage group versus just simple touch, had significant improvements in their pain and mood overall. All right? Again, uh, this is a large randomized clinical trial, phase three. Now, when I talk about massage, especially for the multiple myelo group, um, remember that you know, when we do oncology massage, we don't generally use deep pressure uh, massage, right? Because there could be a lot of bony lesions. Um, and so generally the massage tends to be, it needs to be modified and probably more level one through three. This is a, a Walton scale. And so and if you see a massage therapist, hopefully they've been trained to how to work with cancer patients. Um, they, you know, sometimes we call it oncology massage. There is an organization out there that focuses on oncology patients. And so they need to be using some kind of um, pressure scale. And generally we use one through three. We don't generally use four or five for patients, especially if they have known bone metastasis. Then it's more of a light touch so that we don't uh, have any risks there. Just add that in. And then, um, you know, there was a, a pilot study we did at MD Anderson. I was one of the authors on this with uh, Kay Garcia, uh, looking at uh, uh, just uh, about 19 patients who had chronic uh, neuropathy through their um, treatment with Velcade and thalidomide. And we did demonstrate that at, um, I think it was week nine, you almost see a reduction of, of half of their neuropathy symptoms. So a significant drop uh, in neuropathy, just using acupuncture over, you know, over a two month period, again. So, and there's growing data that they're looking at it in breast cancer and others all, there's a large randomized clinical trial going on with Team Bow at Memorial where they're looking at it for breast cancer patients with neuropathy as well. And so if you look at national guidelines now, this is the uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, NCCN, which uh, commonly is utilized by insurance companies and such. You can see they have a whole thing in the adult cancer pain uh, guidelines where they talk about things like uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, things like massage, acupuncture. And so what you're seeing is that national guidelines are starting to include integrative therapies because the evidence is growing and, and it's worthwhile to think about. Um, this is actually from the American College of Physicians. This came out just a, a, you know, about five years ago where they were talking about back pain. And I think because of the opioid epidemic, there's been a real push to look for non-pharmacologic um, you know, approaches to pain. And you can see here, they talk about there's a um, level of evidence, there's uh, to uh, consider acupuncture and meditation techniques, moderate level quality evidence. So um, I think there's a lot of uh, benefit. So let's, let's switch gears to, from pain, let's go to stress. So does anybody occasionally have stress in this audience? Yeah. Um, and so of course, when you get a stress test, you're probably stressing out because you have to, have to do a stress test too, right? The cardiac stress test. So, um, but then I'm sure some of us also feel anxious and can't sleep at night, right? Yeah, and oftentimes they're related. So if you're stressed, you probably can't sleep. And then if you can't sleep, of course, you're more stressed, right? And if you put pain in here, then if you have pain, you're more stressed and you can't sleep. I mean, it all cycles together. Sometimes we call this symptom clusters, right? Um, but they're very related. And so uh, mind-body practices are probably one of the best well-studied integrative therapies out there. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of Her Herbert Benson. Herbert Benson recently passed away. He came up with the phrase we call relaxation response. Um, and he really uh, understood the science of why things like meditation help patients. Uh, and so he was one of the first in the 70s to really look into this. There's a Herb Benson uh, Mind-Body Institute at Harvard uh, at, you know, named for his work. Um, and so there's really good evidence around stress, mood uh, disturbance, uh, quality of life, and helping with sleep as well, uh, looking at mind-body techniques. So this is a study by Ovelra Lang where they were looking at patients who were getting biopsies. And so um, they had three groups. One group got hypnosis during the procedure. Another group got attention control. So it was kind of like a placebo arm and then standard of care. And what you can see is that the hypnosis group in circles here, solid line circle, they had the lowest pain scores and the lowest anxiety scores going through the procedure. And 
you know, you might say, well, what, uh, why do these lines keep going? Because they actually finish the procedure faster. You know, if your patient's less anxious and has less pain, you kind of get the procedure done more efficiently. And so what they found is that these procedures without the hypnosis asked that, you know, lasted an extra 30 minutes. Okay, so this is a, a nicely done randomized controlled trial by Avera Lang. This is um, Karen Mustian's work from Rochester where they randomized patients to a yoga technique. And what they found is that patients slept much better when they practiced a yoga meditation. Um, you can see their overall sleep quality improved quite a bit on the blue line. Um, that's a large phase three randomized trial. Um, even in, in children, there's uh, benefits for like art therapies, like music and art therapy. You can see here where uh, patients undergoing lumbar puncture, if you had them do some kind of music, their pain and anxiety scores were much lower than the control group. It's a simple meta, you know, music therapy intervention, right? You don't have to give them Benadryl and Ativan and kind of knock them out. Um, you can just use something like this. This is one of my favorite studies. So who, anyone use, I mean, anyone, I'm sure I'll, I'll come across lavender and it's like sold in every soap product, right? Um, but is there any science behind lavender? Well, there's a Japanese group, they published this, uh, I forget, oh yeah, in 2018, oh, actually, no, I think uh, maybe two years, 2020. Um, and so they, there's there a couple ingredients in lavender. I, I love this study. So they, they uh, extracted the different ingredients and they found that there's a compound called linalool. And when you give linalool to these mice, they relax. You know, you can put mice in an open room or put them in water and then they, you see how long they stay. And so the mice were much better relaxed when they just smelled linalool. Okay, the specific compound of lavender. And then what they compared it to things like Ativan. You can give you know, mice Ativan and it had the same effect. And then if you block um, a receptor with flumazenil, which reverses things like Ativan, it had no effect. And so they actually demonstrated the actual compound that causes the relaxation due to lavender. And so, um, you know, there have been studies, and this one's in Bomarabasi, but there are multiple studies. This is a randomized study where they had half the patients smell lavender oil for 15 minutes before a bone marrow biopsy versus a control group. And you can see that mean anxiety between the two groups, the group that got lavender aromatherapy for 15 minutes had 40% decreased anxiety after procedure. Right? So simple intervention, very um, low toxicity. I'm actually very interested in trying to do this at uh, Lenar to do a similar study. So um, you might be asked to participate in a lavender study if you show up at Lenar. Um, but you know, again, NCC and guidelines talks about integrative therapies for pain, nausea, dyspnea, um, and so the evidence base is really growing. So with that, you know, let me summarize that integrative oncology is part of the supportive care spectrum and it can really help optimize your cancer care. Uh, true integrative oncology has to be evidence based and really personalized to your care plan. And it's really important for you if you want to think about integrative approaches, talk to your oncologist, your treating team to say, hey, I'm interested in this. I want to just jump into it because you want to make sure it doesn't interfere, or interact. It's safe for you. And then, you know, you have to think about the timing. When is it appropriate to use one of these therapies? Um, and then there's growing data on acupuncture, mind body therapies, massage, music therapy to help manage pain, anxiety, stress, um, and sleep. So I think with that, I will finish and then I you know, look forward to your questions at the Q&A session later on, so.